The Considered Life by Stéphane Boublil Chapter 3 Faith Regardless of where you're sitting now, reading this mindless drivel, it is tough to deny the possibility of a god getting angry enough to want to wipe us out through either malevolent weather or the commissioning of another album to Fabulous. We certainly deserve it which got me thinking about how easy it would be to expunge what is widely considered to be a state-of-the-art species from the surface of its planet. After all, we've built, thought, imagined, conjectured. After the quest for fire, the wheel, indoor plumbing, and Windows 95. After Saul of Tarsus, Pythagoras, Hegel, and Bernard-Henri Lévy. After the Lascaux cave drawings, the Renaissance, Andy Warhol, and Dash Snow. After Mozart, W.C. Handy, Prince, and Death Cab for Cutie. After the Bronze Age, Metallurgy, Manufacturing in a Million Pieces of Crap from China. After Butter, Margarine, I Can't Believe It's Not Butter, and then Butter Again. After the Crusades, the World Wars, the Gulf Wars, and the East Coast, West Coast Rap Wars. After Vanilla, Chocolate, Pistachio, and Klondike Bars. After the Great Train Robbery, Citizen Kane, Star Wars, and the Adventures of Pluto Nash. After the Tripelium, the Stool, the Chair, and the Ottoman. After Stereo, Surround Sound, THX, and 22.2. After Personal, Local, Global, and Selective Means of Distribution. After Bikes, Cars, Planes, and Suborbital Spaceships. After Abraham, Mohammed, Jesus, and Oprah, after lobotomy, penicillin, brain surgery, and extreme makeovers, non-home edition, after Charlie Chaplin, Marlon Brando, Robert De Niro, and Zac Efron, after Basic, Pascal, C++, and iOS, after Straight, Gay, Bi, and Polyamorous, after Shadow Puppets, Radio, Television, and Disney Digital 3D, after Red, Blue, Green, and Yellow, after Paris, London, New York, and Brussels, after dirt roads, paved roads, highways, and skyways, after silver, gold, diamonds, and unobtainium, after Mies van der Rohe, Wright, Herzog, and Demuron, after Mancala, Monopoly, Simon, and Angry Birds, after Howdy Doody, Eight is Enough, Seinfeld, and Kardashians, after the Gospel of Thomas, The Old Man and the Sea, The Fountainhead, and Harry Potter. After acquaintances, friendships, relationships, and likes. After doing it in the sink, in the missionary position, in the ass, and in a nun's habit. After rocks, the abacus, HP scientific calculators, and Excel. After Lisa, Macintosh, MacBook, and the iPad. After Letterman, Snyder, O'Brien, and Fallon. After Ma Bell, New York Telephone, AT&T, and Skype. After petroleum, corn, electricity, and continuously charged magnetic plates. After bread, tomatoes, high fructose corn syrup, and garlic foam with a side of beet pulp. After the Doric, the Corinthian, the Romanesque, and the steel. After poppies, pot, crack, and World of Warcraft. To think that it could all be erased with one hurling meteor or continued carelessness is at once frightening as well as a balancing reminder of our own frailty. Indeed, with incandescent space matter out of our control, all we have to manage are the shifts in supervision, or at least to believe that a watchful eye stands guard somewhere in case we fail to meet our commitment to reasonably steward our lives and planet through growth and inevitably completion. But I do not believe. Nay, I refuse to believe in any presumed babysitter handsomely paid by the millennia to make sure that we do not run with scissors. Name it what you will, whether God, fate, destiny, or optimism. This caretaker demands a leap of faith in the process external that I am unwilling to deliver. Not that I stand against the romantic appeal of faith, for I too want to feel the force. I too want to believe in magic, but with so much still undiscovered in the world of the scene, it seems a tad brash to outsource so quickly to the merely inferred. It is in fact a tremendous affront to our evolving natural abilities to unshamedly search for answers in other worlds when this one lays beneath our feet, daily, waiting, fertile. 
The mere action of reaching for explanations to what we currently cannot understand betrays impatience more than it does a widely presumed human need for something greater than itself. There is no doubt that a void exists between inner and outer, between seen and invisible, between the questions and the answers. But doesn't it behoove us to search for filler material where we can see it, test it, touch it? We are not so helpless, you and I, as to have to resort to the unseen at every undiscovered corner, are we? Even as every fantasy film baits us to believe in a childish attempt to excuse our natural inclination for delegating responsibility, we must trust ourselves to take in our hands the decisions to make within, without compunction, regret, or doubt. Faith is implicit belief. Faith is the assumption that one can do without knowledge to accept validity. Faith is complete and utter trust and confidence whose most successful implementation, religion, forms but the tip of the murderous iceberg. Faith is something in which we humans actually do not have much of a choice since as a matter of observation, only the past and present are fact and we depend on faith to supply a better tomorrow. But is it reasonable to merely hope for the best? Is there nothing we can do? Faith is generally understood to be an outwardly directed sentiment. You have faith in something else, faith in God, faith in destiny, faith in your friends or co-workers, etc. We talk a lot about having faith in our own abilities, of course, yet most tend to regard themselves as unfit to judge their own worthiness which is why we often rely on others to assess whether or not we are indeed deserving. That is a misconstrued calculation. Much to the contrary, I think you are probably the only person able to correctly assess whether or not you justify either optimism or a good waterboarding. Yet it is judgment that you so seldom choose to exercise. Why? Because, as the sole juror, you do not want to take responsibility for the verdict? Because the object of your evaluation stands too close and is therefore, well, subjective? Nonsense! One problem of this logic lies in the fact that in the developed world in general, in the urban world in particular, we are asked from day one to second-guess ourselves, to be suspicious of opportunities and the subsequent decisions that are presented to us by our generously standardized context, to always consider the pros and the cons, to be mindful of what might happen if, nay, when, the best laid plans go astray, to prepare for the worst. Now time-worn cliches, these expressions are taught too early and discourage us from daring, from acting on impulse, from considering subjectivity a feature, not a bug, but we are so inexplicably involved in the furthering of these oral traditions which devalue reflexivity and point of view that we have forgotten what they mean and what they sadly imply for a sense of self, collective and individual. Having faith in who you might become is easier than working to understand who you are. That is the reason we have seemingly agreed that faith be a condition for apt human beings to live comfortably in society suspecting our world to have gone so wrong, fallen so deep from the surmised original plan, from plenitude and kindness, from generosity and trust to greed and jealousy, to vice and crime, that we feel the only alternative must be faith in what we may amount to in the future, with the help of absentee gods and chimeras. At too many turns to count, every trailer, every moral of every book, Every magazine article, every talk show host begs me to believe in myself in order to live my best life. In the most infuriating and didactic manner, we are constantly being asked to have faith in our own abilities as a condition of success. But do we not need to understand ourselves before we can believe in ourselves? D don't get me wrong, Th the message is good, the message is correct, but the message is empty. If it weren't, wouldn't we not already be better off just by having taken the advice? Why is the world not a little better every day? Why are we not, as the slogan demands, all that we can be? 
Sure, we understand the principle of believing in ourselves. That is basic enough. But merely telling the starving to eat strikes me as charlatan's advice at best. And when we repeatedly take such guidance without having cared enough to find out what kind of nutrition our body needs, we are applying a noble principle to a desolate vessel. That is where the confusion lies, and the futility of the message becomes apparent. Such meaningless confidence invariably leads to false hope and self-righteousness, and is maddeningly counterproductive. The key word in believe in yourself is not believe, as too often presumed. It is yourself. Mostly baseless over-reliance on faith has created a generation of people, young and old, who call themselves go-getters, the ones we love to despise because we know that, more often than not, their performance is not commensurate with whatever talent they think they possess. They're all pumped up, all about the chase, ambitious, thirsty, want, and they need to be rich, to achieve a certain lifestyle. And the unfortunate truth is that whatever path leads to that goal, they will take, because mostly they're not fueled by process, but by the results faith promises. They are not fueled by the satisfaction of getting to know themselves over a certain period of time and observing, from just a few metaphorical inches away, how they may react to new situations, new people, and places to learn from, but rather by perceived notions of appreciation. They have faith in abilities that may or may not be theirs. They have instead been imagined, borrowed, rented, or bought for a particular outcome rather than grown from within for its own sake, that of being human first. Energy squandered for a very ephemeral, if not downright hollow goal, that of success, measured contextually. The idea is that if you prosper in, say, ad sales, it might get you a directorship position, which eventually gets you a vice presidential position, which, in turn, affords you that nice two-bedroom apartment on the Upper East Side, in which, when you finally look around, you may consider yourself done, successful, home. And when you tell yourself that, success and happiness being perceptibly close cousins, surely you can consider yourself happy. If that is your measuring cup, your recipe is flawed, my friend. Soon after this achievement, you may start asking questions that you simply did not take the time to ask heretofore. For example, you might wonder why you have all of this now, and not someone to share it with. Or if you do, why you don't love them more or why he or she isn't more considerate. You might start to question why daddy never showed appreciation, why your sense of right and wrong evolved the way it did and seems to be evolving still, why Joe from accounting never invited you to his Memorial Day barbecue, you know, the, the one where they have so much fun freestyling in the backyard? You can freestyle. You're pretty good, right? Whatever your questions, they will come. I had a few myself. Still do sandwiched between the covers of this book. I believe some unscrupulous people with a pill to sell call this period in a human's life a midlife crisis. It is an easy label to affix, but one whose stereotypical implications are not only undeserved, they are incorrect. Indeed, this is merely a question of timing and priorities. The main question being, why do we not bother asking these questions at the beginning of our lives instead of wasting hard-earned monies on red convertible and bigger tits in the middle? This is not a crisis at all. It is long overdue arousal. Of the brain, you deviant, of the brain. Sadly, we generally believe there to be no time at the beginning for such trifles. As a 13-year-old, try and tell your mom that you first have to use your time at school to experiment with friendship, love, sex, food, religion, travel, and art in order to find out what it is you want out of life by way of methodically exerted self-consideration and only then prepare for a future in uncertain times. I would love to hear how that conversation goes. Ironically, we habitually devote much time exhorting the virtues of preparation for everything else we do especially in mysterious conjunction with perspiration. Yet do not think for one second that preparing for self-knowledge may be the foundation upon which the grand pyramid rests. We hear so much about values, moral and otherwise, being bandied about as the must-haves of a free people. 
But why are those values rented? Why can't they be of our own creation and owned? Why set expectations so unrealistically and start on a path which mostly results in unhappiness, mediocrity, and perhaps worst of all, inevitable disappointment? I blame that entire chain of events on good old faith, don't you know? Faith does not reduce the need for research. It rather complements, fuels, and stimulates it, the best of decisions being made with a little bit of both. We are both the victims and delighted recipients of overly eager faith in our own abilities, for which we are regularly rewarded and slapped in the face. For example, my unshakable belief that I will, eventually, be crowned the leader of a new earth whose people and beasts will live in harmony thanks to my merciful rule and heralded wisdom has been, believe it or not, both a blessing and a curse. Yes, really. But faith gets you in trouble when it is all you use to judge the expectations of what the future may bring, ignoring in the process the importance of what actually makes you, you. You dispose of your gift of reason as if it were yours to waste and pledge life and limb to a conviction whose existence only ever depends on your belief in it as you fill the uncomfortable void of unverifiability and lie there, contemplative, proud of your ability to surrender. I cannot blame you, for the conspiracy to get you to submit is far and wide, but I do not want to merely hope for the better, but make the better without dependence or trepidation. Hope is but the result of a favorable assumption made about the influential power we choose to supply us with the support we feel is needed. But what are we even looking for when convinced to believe in the external powers of love, God, or country? We are looking for happiness, aren't we? The same ordinary happiness we're legally entitled to pursue, ask God to provide, and read about in Hallmark cards. In the same way that a good life is not one that necessarily needs an object, but absolutely a subject, a good life is not one that necessarily needs happiness either, but absolute victory over fear. That is the reason why I seek serenity over happiness, a goal both loftier and harder to reach in the hundreds or less years we have to try, for it requires less baggage on the road to the end a practical concern for those of us with weak arms, but a foundational one for those with strong minds. Whereas happiness can be found in moments, serenity is a state. Whereas happiness depends on context to exist, serenity is judged by no one. Whereas happiness is an opinion, serenity is a decision. And the life considered, its observations and drawn deductions, is the strategy to get there. Faith unfortunately obliges us to look beyond ourselves and value inherited belief, preferring the ready-to-eat outside world to the one inside, for which we have to learn to cook. Moreover, on the outside live two great plagues that are rarely name-checked by the Center for Disease Control, the past and the future. Whether pulling us back through nostalgia and regret or pushing us forward toward fear and uncertainty, Little of benefit has ever come from contemplating either with sustained focus. Yet, happiness depends on having made peace with yesterday while being hopeful that tomorrow will at least be as good as today. Neither promise delivered on with much consistency. Keeping the past or future handy only weighs down the present, the playground of life at hand. Not yet hip to its later mainstream appeal, yet already anticipating the need for redefinition, Socrates, that old fatty, once let loose that the secret of happiness, you see, is not found in seeking more, but in developing the capacity to enjoy less. A point well made, but hardly ever taken. We must subtract. That said, faith has a remarkable transformative effect when it is rewarded, because it makes you feel invincible. If you think that having faith in something will make it happen, and it does, you feel that the method works. I'm looking at you, the secret. Well, the world is not quite as binary as we would like to think it is. Rare are the instances in which an infinity of variables don't mess up a perfectly good theory. If you do achieve your goal, or get close, 
Or even if you do not get there at all, can you really blame faith or lack thereof for the success or failure of any endeavor? Well, simply put, no. You had faith in yourself, but really your ability is achieving the work, succeeding or failing on its own terms. Your skills, your awareness of strengths and weaknesses are doing it. Having lived a conscious and considered life delivers on the promise faith has made on your behalf because the background information you gathered on yourself, on your likes, your dislikes, your favorite color and mystic animal, is providing the necessary information to judge whether that faith was, after all, justified or not. Faith, in fact, is a checking mechanism to see whether you have correctly assessed your own abilities. No less, no more. When put in its place, faith seems rather useful. But should one then have faith in a person or in their ability to accomplish? If in a person, it assumes that you once had confidence in them and would be willing and able to delegate functions to them, whether taking care of you when you're sick or competently styling your hair. The first time you venture into a new hairdresser's lair, you're not sure he or she can be trusted, but really, what choice do you have? Your old one moved to Florida to be with his mother. Thing is, we have to take risks once in a while to bestow our trust on new members of our ever-expanding circle, which seems to be the essential first step of faith. So let's say they cut your hair nicely the first time. You go back for another, a month later, and your faith in them builds. And every time it becomes stronger, until such day that you feel comfortable reading an eight-month-old copy of Dog Fancy while sitting in the chair, Paying the snapping scissors next to your head little attention. Trivial? Sure. But look around at all those you have come to trust over the years by applying the same principle and realize that your faith came through knowledge and understanding, self and otherwise, not unverifiable acceptance of the possibility of hairstyling genius residing in all of us. And the story goes on. Some companies employ thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, who each do a small part of a big job. Why? Because somebody first invested faith in somebody else's ability to do something reasonably well, who did the same with another, and another, and another, which resulted in those hundreds of thousands of people seldom understanding or sometimes even knowing what the person next to them does, because there isn't any time for or use grasping the big picture. Why would they ever want to, caught up as they are in their assigned small stuff? And why would the people at the top of the chain ever encourage reflection, especially when such dutiful obedience has made them so very rich? Where is the positive effect of faith in all of this? Is it still there, or have we conveniently stashed it away to the profit of the company, which, if unsatisfied more than twice, will replace you at the drop of a hubcap. Is it a surprise then that said habits also find their way home? Where your girlfriend's adoring gaze flatters yet also deludes you into thinking that you can do no wrong for a while, and in a way convinces you to replace the faith that you should have in yourself with the one she has in you? And you can ride that for a while. When somebody loves you with them googly eyes, it is so easy to replace requisite self-esteem with outer esteem, which seldom lasts. It is a very nice and helpful addition to one's day, but should never substitute for the love flowing within us for ourselves. And faith has a tendency to help us down the easier path because we put such high value and recognition on seeing oneself as valuable in someone else's eyes, even if that value is empty of any meaningful consequence, a knowledge that doesn't prevent us from pining for it. I, for one, I'm still waiting to see such appreciation glistening over my own father's pupils. For reasons still cloudy and confusing to me, I do not remember ever hearing him say he loves me or say to my face that what I ever did was valuable. I have never felt his confidence in me so that I may grow some of my own. Although he and my mother, as young and inexperienced parents, did not quite yet know how to rear a child concurrent with their own development, they still provided a setting in which abundance and freedom thankfully were the rule of law. In fact, the argument could easily be made that the luxury of perceived thoughtfulness in my life and the pages of this book were afforded in large part by access to such abundance, which allowed for an expensive education, 
time to leisurely be taken choosing next steps and funding them when ready. Yet with all the enviable space, both metaphorical and living, still, I waited for communication to be transmitted, for love to be announced, for faith to be bestowed. I realize now that my waiting, yearning, and expectations were all wrong, all entitled, and only ever contributed to my feeling alone and dejected. But that was not his fault. Pity party! Did I become the stronger for it per my own philosophy outlined herewith? Sure. But consciousness and understanding are mere tools in the shed, looking forward to being used in the construction of a thing, of a person, of a life, and I am only 40 years old, which is to say, in the plan-drawing phase of my project. Lucidity is but the first step. Next comes action. The most effective way to do it is to do it, once mused Amelia Earhart. And how right she was. We must use faith and not let it use us, for it now has devolved into a value by and for itself, its own means to its own end. The considered life is about breathing meaning into every part of our existence. And if faith has little meaning, how are we to make decisions that pertain to our well-being and happiness? Funny enough, in today's society, the people we hoist up to that pedestal on the covers of magazines are the ones who routinely take such leaps of faith. We celebrate them, stalk them, punish them with overbearing disapproval even for the risks they dare take. People brave enough to believe in themselves and go forth, the ones who accomplish what we had heretofore deemed impossible, something witnessed almost daily in the scientific and athletic realms as we challenge each other to do better, higher, and stronger, and wonder who will achieve the extraordinary. And in the time it takes some people to argue why something may be impossible, the faithful have already finished and moved on. Perhaps we need to redefine faith in a way that does not rely on the invisible but rather puts trust in one's own familiar and understood abilities, one of the pillars of the considered life, because it is the direct consequence of self-awareness. It is precisely what happens once you have learned who you are and what to do with that information, or at least have begun on that journey. Faith, from that particular point of view, is a consequence of confidence. It is self-approval that allows you to ask that guy out, start a company, Eat something you never have or travel to a place that scares you. Faith then fuels your ability to withstand change, to withstand new intellectual challenges. That is the goal. And it comes only after applied consideration to one's own life so far, however painful or delightful it might be. My friend Melissa once exclaimed, unprovoked and over furtada, that at this moment in her life she was feeling closer than ever to the Nietzschean concept of amor fati, the love of fate. I am paraphrasing for effect. For those with less philosophical theory under your dented belts than she, good old Friedrich went a couple of steps beyond the existentialists of the 1940s in bearing wishful anti-determinism under a pile of empty bottles of Tide and stated that fate was not a promise, as it is in the religious context, neither unalterable nor imperatively moral but rather the result of the collusion between what he called interpenetrable opposites, freedom and necessity. This is another nail in the coffin for the improvers of mankind, those who believe that there exists inherent perfectibility for our sad, sad species, even though we prove, time and time again, that if there are decisions to be made, we will inevitably make the wrong ones. But the idea that we may cheerfully accept all the right and wrong decisions of one's life, whether preordained or not, is indeed an amazing notion, for it frees us from evaluation. When we decide to desire, quote, nothing to be different, not forward, not backward, not in all eternity, unquote, we simply have faith in the self today. Loving our fate in decision-making, not as evidence of an immutable future, but a malleable one, does lead to an understanding of our basic, some might say built-in, inability to know all, a wonderfully freeing concept. Confidence in one's knowledge of uncertainty is how David was able to take on and beat Goliath, wasn't it? Embracing this fundamental tenet of our nature eventually leads us to more artfully consider our lives. 
one of the few ways some of us have found to make sense of the confusion we feel. And after you have chosen the tools of your art, may they be spreadsheets or paintbrushes, you must leave a willful void for fate to take its rightful place at your table, whatever the consequences. They are the fun part, the icing on a cake exhaustively built with effort, disagreement, tears, joy, compromise, attention, passion, and purpose, most of the time. The trick is to enjoy the unknown, to have faith in what it will bring, even if the surprises are sour, and some of them undoubtedly will be. Gamble. Always.